This is my father's secret. Strange how the merest trifles will sometimes call up in the most vivid colours a train of recollections we had fancies were so laid away in the lumber room we all have in some back recess of our brains that they have lost all distinct form and reality. Tonight, a sound in the street at midnight, a cry perhaps from some houseless wanderer wakened in terror from her shivering, shelterless slumbers, thrilled through my very soul with the startled agony of fear, such a sound excited in my childish mind. How many years ago? Fifty, at least. And brought back to me, with a tumultuous rush, all the series of circumstances that then so oppressed my life with a vague, nameless, unspeakable horror. And when, in later life, these circumstances were explained... The explanation only substituted real for imaginary terrors. An only child, my early days were spent in the old place that had been in our family for upwards of three centuries. It was situated in Cornwall, near the sea, far from any town of the least importance, and it and our lives, my father's and mine, for I was motherless, were so isolated that often months, nay, I may say years, passed without our ever seeing a new face. In those days of which I speak, my father must have been still a young and handsome man, but children commonly have such incorrect ideas as to the ages and appearances of their elders, and of their parents especially, that the memory of my father always presents itself as that of a middle-aged, sombre, silent, not generally pleasing or attractive man. I loved him less than I feared him, not that he was ever other than gentle and most kind to me, but somehow there was, I know not how, an uneasy feeling subsisting between us. We never were on the terms of fond protection on the one side, of clinging confidence on the other, that alone constitute the natural and healthy relations between father and child. What's above all caused this uneasy sensation on my part was the consciousness. I cannot say when it first came, but come it did, gradually growing on me in a way whose oppression I cannot now recall without a return of its weight, that my father was constantly, furtively and secretly, but constantly, watching me. Watching me, too, with a sort of anxious, fearful expectancy, as if there was about me something alarming or unnatural that should stamp me as a creature apart from the rest of my species. From this thought came the yet more harassing one that such a feeling on his part might have a real foundation I knew not of. I can perfectly remember secretly studying my own face and figure in the large cheval glass that stood in an unused dressing room, my mother's, as I afterwards learnt, to discover if I had any personal peculiarity or sign or deformity that might in any way account for this singular demeanour of my father's, and watching my own words and habits and behaviour to test if in them lay the cause thereof. But I could myself discover nothing. The mirror only showed me a large, sorry, pale, large-eyed, delicate-looking boy, tall and slight beyond his years, with a particularly grave, reflective cast of countenance. These particulars, my recollection of my own image, rather than my then view of it, informs me and loose, dark, curling hair hanging over the forehead, and giving additional shade and solemnity to the eyes. And when I turned my thoughts inwards, to study as well I could as I could my moral characteristics, I could in them detect no incongruities calculated to justify uneasiness. At last, never shall I forget the months of watchful terror that followed that supposed explanation of the mystery I fancied I had found a clue to the awful secret. Sometimes, weary with wandering about alone, I used to roam into the library, and, taking down a book by chance, try to find some amusement therein. Few of the volumes were in any way calculated to suit the taste and comprehension of a child, being chiefly of a grave character, 
but at last I hit upon a collection of old, legendary poems and ballads, and herein found ample food for interest. Among these was the Breton legend of Bisclaveret, the tale of the knight who, owing to some fearful but unexplained fatality, was compelled at certain times to assume the shape and nature of a wolf. Could I be a Bisclaveret? Was the question that instantly addressed itself was the question that instantly addressed itself to my mind? Did my father know that at some time I was destined to undergo this fearful transformation? Was he acquainted with the indications that announced the change? Had he yet perceived any of them? Such were the questions that now haunted my waking thoughts and my nightly dreams, and as, no doubt, these terrible anxieties produced a visible effect on my looks and manner, my father, full of an uneasy terror whose nature I mistook, increased his painful surveillance, and, by it, my racking alarms. I saw the moment when I should myself perceive the commencement of the transformation, I pictured the manner of it in fifty ways. Sometimes I fancied it would be gradual, and I should see and feel the slow blending of the human and bestial natures, till the former should be swallowed up in the latter, and I should become, for the time being, at all events, a real wolf. At others I fancied the change would be instantaneous, that, from a boy, I should suddenly spring into the raging, ravening monster, fall, who could tell, on those around me, my father, my nurse, my favourite animals, pony, dog or bird, and then, with bloody fangs, rush howling, an object of hatred and terror to all, into the dark woods that extended for miles around the house, ending, perhaps, by falling into the black abyss of one of the worn-out mines that were not rare in the district. Our house, which was a very large one, had been built and added to at different periods, and my father and I only occupied a comparatively small portion of one end of it. This portion was shut out from the rest by a door at the termination of a passage, which was kept so entirely closed up that I had never seen it opened, and the unused part of the house I had never once entered. Often, with intense curiosity, I had looked up at the shuttered windows, wondering what manner of rooms they were that daylight never visited, longing, yet half dreading, to explore them. Another object of curious and unsatisfied interest to me was a walled enclosure extending from the extreme end of the deserted part of the house, and covering a space of perhaps about half an acre. The wall was very high, much higher than an ordinary garden wall, and the door of it, which led into a dark shrubbery walk, now almost blocked up with tangled undergrowth, was kept constantly locked, and, indeed, had no appearance of having been opened for any number of years. Why this was so I was never able to learn. I had asked the question of my nurse, a resident in the house since before my birth, but she had replied evasively that she supposed the key was lost, and at any rate there were gardens enough and to spare gardens enough and to spare without using that one, adding an injun adding an injunction to me not to go near there, as the shrubbery was damp and full of briars and nettles, and I should hurt myself and get my clothes torn. The result of her caution was that the next day found me making my way through the tangled underwood in the direction of the closed door that so excited my curiosity. For some time the noise I made forcing a passage kept, kept from me the knowledge that I was not alone in my progress. But pausing to take breath, I suddenly became aware of the fact, and, turning round, I found myself face to face with my father. In a voice of severity, very unusual when addressed to me, he asked me what I was doing there, adding a prohibition ever to return, as I should be sure to hurt myself, and he would not have it. From that moment I became convinced that within the enclosure of those walls lay the secret of the mystery of our existence and of my father's strange watchfulness of me, and I resolved, come what might, to strive to solve it. But two days later was commenced the erection of a high, strong paling around the shrubbery, and not being tall or strong enough to scale it, independent of the risk of being detected in the attempt to do so, I was baffled. 
I was, I suppose, at this time about seven or eight years old, but no notice ever being taken of my birthday, I did not then know what my age was, and now I can only guess approximately what it might have been. One thing I gained by this inkling of a discovery, and that was the dispersion of my terrors on the Bisclavere grounds. No, I felt assured that not in myself, alone and individually, lay the cause of my father's conduct towards me. There, behind that shrubbery, within those walls, was hidden the true explanation, and I only was an object of anxiety as being somehow connected with that impenetrable mystery. That such was the fact, and how it was so, I had to learn later. Months passed away, perhaps a year may have gone by, when one night I went to bed about my usual hour, half past eight or nine o'clock. It had been a hot summer's day, and a long ride had fatigued me, so that I slept unusually sound. I was, for a child, rather a light sleeper in general. When... I can describe the sensation in no other way than as that of being wrenched instantaneously from profound sleep into terrified waking. I was roused by a scream, so loud, so long, so agonised, that I sprang up shivering with a ghastly horror that made the cold sweat burst out over my quivering limbs. In an instant, my father, I slept in a little room opening from his, rushed in, with a face I shall never forget, a look whose anxious terror was all directed to me, as if excited far less by that hideous sound than by the fear of its influence on me. Bursting into hysterical sobs, I stretched my arms to him, and almost for the first time I could remember, he took me to his breast, clasping, clasping me close, kissing, soothing and reassuring me like a woman, Yet I had a consciousness, at the same time, dividing his attention to me with a restless, intense anxiety as to the circumstance that had caused it, mingled with a dread of a recurrence of the alarm, an impatient desire to investigate the matter, of which, however, he attempted no explanation, being, I suppose, too shaken by his emotions to invent a plausible one. While he still held me thus, my nurse entered. This seemed to relieve him. I observed that they exchanged looks of mutual intelligence, and my father, placing me in her arms, once more kissed me, telling me to fear nothing, and taking a light, he left my room by the opposite door from that by which he had entered it. "'What was it, nurse?' I whispered, when I had become a little reassured. She hesitated. "'Must have been Jane, frightened by a rat, or perhaps she had the nightmare. But it was nothing that could hurt you, dear.' I knew this was not the true explanation, but I also knew I was not likely to get another, so I was silent, and I suppose she thought satisfied. More than once, after that night, did the same harrowing sound disturb me, and sometimes the shrieks were not single, but iterated with fearful energy. On each occasion my father manifested the same intense disturbance and anxiety, though he endeavoured to conceal it from me, and invented some plausible explanation which I was forced to appear to accept, though my life was rendered miserable by the terrors with which this state of things beset it. One morning, after the shrieks had been more than usually terrific, my father, apparently driven into a desperate resolution, announced to me that we were going away for a time, that he would accompany me to our destination, and, leaving me with my nurse, he would come often to see me. I had never been from home before, and the idea of the change, yet less for its own sake than for the escape it promised me from my terror-haunted life, afforded me unspeakable relief. Whether the evidence of this awakened in my father more pain or pleasure, I can hardly tell. Certainly the feelings were mingled. In a week it was fixed we should go into Devonshire, where, in a village known to my nurse, we were to take up our abode, but for no specified time. I counted the days with eager impatience, and already five of the seven had departed. At night I had gone to bed, and fallen asleep with a pleasant, dreamy sense of approaching escape, and had slept, I suppose, several hours, when I suddenly awakened by the sound of the splashing of water in my room. 
Looking towards the washing stand, a nightlight, without which my terrors would not allow me to sleep, faintly lighted the chamber. I described the figure of a woman whose back was towards me washing her hands. I had never seen her before, of that I was quite certain, nor anything the least like her. She was tall and thin, dressed in a loose, shapeless garment, and her hair, which was dark, was cropped close to her head. Apparently unconscious of my presence, there she stood, washing her hands, but with an energy and intensity of purpose, curious in so ordinary an occupation, rubbing and wringing them as if she would take the skin off, pausing to examine them, then with an exclamation of impatient disappointment, sometimes a sort of shudder, plunging them back into the water, splashing, rubbing and wringing them again and again. So extreme were my amazement and terror at this extraordinary apparition, that for some minutes I could neither speak nor move. As I lay, I heard the clock strike three, and as it was summer I knew daylight was near. This was some slight relief. If I could only lie still till sunrise, I thought I might summon courage to address my wondrous visitor, or perhaps she might then retire. So I tried to regulate even my breathing so as not to attract her attention, and lay still, my eyes riveted on her with a fearful fascination, waiting for what might come. For what did come, I was little prepared. After long scouring and rubbing her hands, but apparently with no satisfactory result, she turned, and I saw her face. Child as I was, I felt that it had in it a something that placed it out of the nature or order of all other faces, not without traces of beauty, even in its haggard pallor and sunken eyes, it yet wore the stamp of something that seemed to me not to belong to humanity. There was a sort of mingled wildness and vacancy in the expression of the pale lips, of the troubled eyes, unnaturally yet gloomily bright in their dark and hollow orbits, like sunken fires in airless caves, and the thick, cropped, dark hair coming in a ridge straight across the forehead, added not a little to the singular effect of the countenance. At first her eye seemed to wander vacantly about the room, as if with a half-consciousness that it was unfamiliar to her. Then, after a while, it lighted on me. She came quickly up to the bed, gazed at me with eager, startled scrutiny, then with hasty hand drawing down the bedclothes a little way, she began feeling my throat feeling it, not graspingly or clutchingly or as though intending it any harm, but as if to satisfy some intense anxiety, to assure herself of some peculiarity respecting it. What followed I cannot tell, for with her hand, deadly cold and wet on my throat, I became insensible. A brain fever was the result of this night's adventure, and then came a dark period, I have never dared to inquire into the particulars of it, or even how long it lasted, of overshadowed consciousness, from which I awoke but gradually and with occasional relapses. That the period must have been considerable I know, for when I recovered I had arrived at another stage of growth, being no longer a child but a youth, and my father's hair was sprinkled with grey and his face marked with lines I did not remember. We were in France when I awoke from that long mental slumber, of whose very dreams I had no recollection, living in Brittany, in as retired a manner as we had lived in the old house in Cornwall. Then we travelled for some years, and so I grew to manhood, quite sane and in full possession of my mental faculties, but always with a lingering sense of instability in their tenure, a dread of aught that might tend to shock or shake them, and a shy unwillingness to join in the society of those of my own age, or indeed to go forth at all into a world which had never been other than alien and unknown to me. So I continued to the age of three and twenty, when my father died, died taking with him the secret that had so terribly influenced my life. But years afterwards, when time and the necessity of action had brought with them their salutary results, and that living like other men, I had become as other men. My uncle, my father's only brother, 
revealed to me the mystery. My father, at eight and twenty, had married my mother, then barely seventeen. She was very pretty, very childish, fond of pleasure and the amusements of her age, and having been one of a large and happy and well-united family, the change from her own gay home and circle to the lonely old house in Cornwall, and my father's grave, studious habits, fell heavily on her, and soon she pined in secret for what she had lost. My father saw it, and though deeply pained and disappointed, he was the first to propose what she was longing for, a visit to her family. This was some three months before the expected period of my birth. He took her to her home, and it was settled that there he should leave her till her confinement should take place, at which period he was to rejoin her, and in due time to conduct her back to Cornwall. But ere she had been more than a month away, news came to her that my father had been attacked with a pleurisy of the most dangerous kind, and she, smitten with grief and something like self-reproach, would listen to no persuasions that could keep her from him, and the next day, attended by her maid, set out, travelling post to join him. Early in the morning they had started, intending to sleep that night at a town of some importance on the way, but the roads were heavy, and the horses so jaded that it was evident they could not reach their destination till far on in the night, even supposing it possible to achieve that much, and already fatigue and anxiety were beginning to tell strongly on my mother. So there was nothing for it but to take the first tolerable shelter they could reach, and at ten o'clock they were glad to find themselves in a rural, but really not uncomfortable roadside inn. Supper dispatched, my mother was fain to retire to bed. The room, though small and poorly furnished, was clean, and the bed looked not uninviting, and the only serious drawback to its convenience was that my mother's maid had to sleep in a room above, there being none other unoccupied on that floor. However, as Wilson's chamber was the one immediately over my mother's, and that she was a light sleeper, it would be easy, by tapping with the point of an umbrella on the low ceiling, at any moment to summon her, in case of there being an occasion to do so. And so, in a short time, my mother, worn out with all she had gone through in the long day, dropped into a profound sleep, and one by one the lights and the noises in the house sank into darkness and silence, and only the mice held their nightly orgies behind the old wainscoting. Only in one room a light was still burning at two o'clock in the morning. About that time my mother awoke, but in such ghastly terror and horror that it seemed not like waking from a wholesome sleep, but like waking from death in the place of outer darkness, where are weeping and gnashing of teeth. For something was clutching and tearing frantically at the bedclothes with a horrible, gasping, gurgling sound unlike anything in or out of nature, and there was a struggling and writhing on the floor by the bedside as if the thing was striving to clamber up on it. And so strong was my mother's impression that this was so, that though unable to scream, she put forth her hand as if to repulse the thing and felt it come in contact with something hot and wet that clung stickily to her fingers. Then she found breath to burst into wild ringing shrieks and lights were brought, and lying by the bedside was a man in the agonies of death, with his throat gashed and the blood welling from it and saturating the bedclothes, and crimson on my mother's hand. She never recovered her senses, and a few days after I was and a few days after I was born. My father, as soon as it was possible, much sooner than it was safe for him to travel, came and took her and me, and me, the one mad, the other apparently dying, to Cornwall. Two rooms on the ground floor of the house were arranged for her, opening on the enclosure that had so often excited my curiosity, so that she might, unseen, have air and exercise. There, attended only by her maid, an elderly woman, attached to her from her childhood, and by my father, she remained till the period of her death, which occurred but a few weeks after the night on which I had seen her for the last time, for the first and last time. During the earlier years of her insanity, she had, unusually, been tolerably quiet, 
but some months before her death the infirmity took a new turn. She would be seized with sudden frenzies, uttering the shrieks that had occasionally reached my ears, going in imagination through the scene at the inn, constantly washing her hands to remove the blood with which her distracted fancy stained them, and examining the throats of my father, the doctor and nurse, as she had examined mine. And now was explained the meaning of the painful surveillance of me, which, in my poor father, had so disturbed me. A constant dread was on him, lest the condition of my mother's intellect at the period of my birth might exert an influence on mine. Day and night this terror haunted him. Every word, look, and action of mine was weighed and studied with this idea, and little did he suspect how this very anxiety, or rather the unconscious evidence of it, tended towards producing a state of mind calculated to engender, under existing circumstances, the very effect he dreaded. Above all things, he trembled lest the truth of my mother's awful fate should, in any way, reach me, and thus arose the mystery which I verily, which I verily believe might have been yet more dangerous to me than even some knowledge of the rightful fact. Poor father, if error, if error there were, it was wholly error of judgment, and I have no reason to blame him to do other than regard his memory with pitying tenderness, to lament over a fate so undeserved and so terrible. He sleeps now under a monument I have erected in our parish churchyard, side by side with the wife from whom in life he was so cruelly divided. The unfortunate cause of the calamity which thus overshadowed the lives of a family proved to be a young gentleman, the son of Scottish parents, who, tired of the monotony of his quiet home life, had come south, fallen in with evil company, and, having disgraced the honest name he bore, resolved, in a moment of desperation, to end his life. No sooner, however, had his hand committed the fatal act than, repentant and terrified, his only thought was to seek assistance. Between his room and my mother's was a door of communication, which neither she nor Wilson had observed, and through this he, having heard voices on the other side, trailed himself, and, unable to speak, had sought to call my mother's attention in the way described. But aid came too late, and in a few minutes later he expired, involving in his own fate those innocent sufferers. Well, that's a cheery one, isn't it? So, uh, yeah, that's... That's my father's secret, as, as the story is, is called. And the... yeah. So how are we doing, chat? That was, as you may have guessed, that was the one with the content warning for self-harm. So hopefully everyone that needs that caught that and is aware of that. As I go for some water. Also, hey, Sil, welcome. How are you doing? I hope you are. Hope you are well. Hope things are good. Um, yeah. So, what's the time? See, the, these stories are all quite long. Kind of just long enough to not really fit in two, which is why I'd only picked out two for tonight. Or tonight. So, I'm wondering if I might take a bit of an early break, and then come back. For the next one. Um, because I've got... Basically, there's two others that I have read. One which is quite a lengthy piece by Edgar Allan Poe. Which is mainly just him talking about... Well, it, like the, the protagonist's wife. It's just endless pages of him describing her face. And then eventually some stuff happens. Um, but I wasn't going to read that one tonight. I might come back to it. It wasn't like bad, it was just extremely wordy. Um but yeah, the other the other one there's some stuff in here that I really want to read, but it's also just very long. And I didn't really give myself time to read it earlier. Um but the other one that I'm going to read is called The Phantom Hair by the yeah, the sort of enigmatically titled, that's the word I'm looking for, MH. But, yeah, I think... Oh, 
heating's coming on. Nice. I think what I should do is I should take an early break there because I've, I've talked so much this evening and read very little. Um, so yeah, go to a break there and then come back for second half of this where I should read The Phantom Hair. So see you in a minute or five. Don't forget, break for me is a break for you. So get up, walk around, stretch. Refresh, yeah, refresh your tea and stuff like that. Don't refresh your tea. That's for a different week. We'll get to flesh tea at some point, no doubt. I'm sure. In one of there's going to be in one of these stories, but not now, not tonight. And see you in five minutes. Bye for now.
and welcome back. I hope that you've had a good and worthwhile break. Um, and also, yeah, Dr. Lemon Socks, thank you, for, thank you for the sub. Very much appreciated and welcome. Um, yeah. You, you join us for the second half of this Cornish Horrors to Literacy stream, where I'm, I'm reading from a book of tales of the weird, um, and these are specifically ones that are set in or in some way feature like Cornwall and Cornish stuff. Uh, we've had one sad tale of uh, well, an, an adult re recollecting his time as a boy when he thought he might have been a werewolf. Um, turns out he wasn't. It's just that people at that time didn't handle mental health very well and bad things happened and worse things happened as a consequence to many people. Um, but yeah, that was, that was the first half. And exactly, featuring Cornwall. Because Cornwall's a great place. I love it. I love it dearly. Um, and so, yeah, when I, when I saw this like book of, oh, we've got Cornish gothic folk horror stuff going on. Yeah, give me that. Sign me up for that. Um, yeah, this is this is the second the second of tonight's stories. Um, usually, if I've got like a bunch of shorter ones, I I would try and go for longer. But I think. Yeah, these ones are all quite long, and I've not, like, picked out and pre-read other things for today. I should try and do some more preparation for next week, so I've got, like, a range of things that I can be ready to read if, if I've got some extra time. But tonight, I'm just going to do this one other one, which is, is reasonably long. This should take a, a little while to get, get, yeah. Sorry, if you can hear a cat howling in the background, that is one of the cats here who, she is fine... She's perfectly fine. What she does is she catches a toy and then parades it around the house, like drags it in her mouth, just screaming for attention. Um, yes, exactly. The mighty hunter. She is. She has caught a toy, her favourite toy to catch, and wishes for everybody to know that it has been caught and slain, and she is very pleased with herself. Um, so that's what's going on in the background. Other cat update: Joey is just asleep on the bed and seemingly quite content. Maybe he'll stay there, stay there for the rest of the stream. Maybe he won't. We'll find out in time together. It'll be a fun mystery. Um, I can have some water. That's the sound you're about to hear. Also gives a, a whistle while I stop drinking from that. So that's an interesting quirk. Yeah. So anyway, the second story for tonight is The Phantom Hair by M.H. This is sort of a, a Cornish... Um, how does it describe it? I got it right earlier and I've just, com I just completely gone blank. The old stream brain has turned on in full force. Um, H-A-R-E, like the, you know, the long rabbit. Um, yeah, sort of a Cornish legend, folklore thing. Um about sort of a, a white hair being sort of an kind of an, an ominous portent. Um, just trying to see how it's put here. Um, in Lou in particular, Lou is a place in Cornwall. Uh, the white hair also warns of a storm at sea and is specifically feared by fishermen and sailors. Um, oh yeah, so uh, yeah, white hair of Lou, which has variants across other Celtic regions. In this legend, a woman betrayed by the man she loves wholly returns to haunt him in the form of a white hare. She will follow him unrelentingly, even warning him of danger to ensure he lives a long and guilty life. So that's that's what we're in for here. Um, again, I don't, it's, it's sort of spoilers, I guess, saying like, oh, that's what the story is about. But you know, it's 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 in the text. It's not like some big twist reveal about oh, what does this mean? Because that's that's like a a context and understanding that's been lost over the years as we don't hear these sorts of legends now whereas at the time these were written and told people would be like a white hair oh that's bad tell me more so yeah I, I i feel like that's fine to to read that little bit of information out beforehand 
but yeah, without without much more talk, um, since you know you're, you're here to listen, not chat, I guess. Why not? I I'm going to carry on. And this is the second story for tonight, by by the author M H, is called the Phantom Hair. Bessie, did you ever see a white hair? A white hair? No, never. Why do you ask it? Susan Stanhope did not say why she asked it. She seemed to co to have come home in a kind of excitement. I saw her fly up the broad garden path between the beds, crowded with sweet and homely flowers, as though she were in a hurry to escape from some danger. Her light footfall ran up the stairs to our bedroom, where I sat sewing, and she burst in upon me with the above question. Do not you Cornish people attach some, attach some superstition to the appearance of a white hair, Bessie? She continued. I think I once heard Ma say so. Well, I fancy we do, now you speak of it, but I don't know what the superstition is. Susan folded the mantle she had taken off put her bonnet up, and sat down in a chair on the opposite side of the open window. I had drawn my little work table as close to the window as possible, being anxious to finish mending Janie's frock, which she had torn at the brook stile, and the twilight was already upon us. In September, we were in the earlier days of it, the evenings draw in quickly. We lived at the Mount Farm, a large estate belonging to the Bertrams, situated near Penryn in Cornwall. My father, Roger Trenathy, had been born in the parish. His people had rented it for several generations. He was what is called a substantial man, and was superior in cultivation to some farmers. But he lived in a homely style, and we, his children, had to work, as he said, all farmers' daughters ought. Roger was his only son, already as busy on the land as he was, as he was, in the eldest of all, oh, sorry, excuse me. I was the eldest of all. Eunice was next to Roger and seventeen this summer. Little Jane was ten only, and went day boarder to Mrs. Pollock's school. A great deal lay upon me, both of work and care. Our two maids were light-headed things, and Eunice was lighter-headed than they were. Our mother was dead. She had been a clergyman's daughter, and was a true gentlewoman. It was to her training and companionship that I owed all the culture I possessed. Roger was like her. He had her pleasant eyes and her sweet smile. Her only sister was, had married a clergyman, the Reverend Philip Stanhope. He and his wife had both died, leaving one child, Susan, this, name, sorry, this same Susan now visiting us. Susan had had a first-rate education, but she had not much fortune, just one thousand pounds in the three per cents. When she left school, some eighteen months ago, my father had said she must make her home with us, but she preferred to be independent and went out as a governess. Moreover, she wrote us word, in a cordial but half-jesting manner, that she should not care to live always in a farmhouse. This was the first holiday she had had, seven weeks long it was to be, and she had come to spend it with us, arriving two days ago. "'You found your way readily to Dame Mellon's, Susan?' I asked her, as I stitched away, for she and I were both to have gone to the widow Mellon's cottage after tea, to take the old woman some wool for knitting. For years she had knitted my father's winter stockings, as she did those of many other people around. It was the only work she could do, being blind, and we all liked to employ her. And, by the way, though I have called her old, she was not yet fifty. Care and illness had served to wrinkle her brow and to bend her back, and we young people are apt to think everybody else old if they have left forty years behind them. But Janie came home with this dreadful rent in her new frock, and the rent went more ways than one. I was angry with her and had to mend it, and Susan said she would take the wool. So I let her take it, adding a little basket of things from our plentiful larder, and directing her which way to go. "'Oh, yes, I found it quite well,' answered Susan. "'It is a picturesque little college, resting in that shady dell.' "'What made you ask me about a white hair, Susan?' "'Because I've just seen one. I have had an adventure, Bessie.' "'Indeed. What was it?' 
You were talking yesterday about Miss Bertram, she said, after a pause, never answering my question, that she was to marry Mr. Arley. It was just... You know, as she passed the gate yonder in her pony carriage, drawing an old lady. Her aunt. Well, is she to marry Mr. Arley? Why, of course she is. They're to be married in November. He is her cousin. Not a first cousin, a second or third. When her father, Sir William, died thirteen months ago now, the title lapsed, but the hall and all the large estates were left to Miss Bertram. Upon that, Hubert Arley as is said, hastened to make her an offer, and after a time, but not at first, she accepted him. Susan lifted her blue eyes quickly. His name is Hubert, is it? What sort of a looking man is he? A very handsome one. Tall and dark? Tall and rather dark. He is very good looking indeed. "'Then I don't think him so, Bessie,' she returned in a contradictory positive tone. "'He may be what many people call handsome, as to features and colouring, "'but he has a most disagreeable expression, and—' "'Why, Susan,' I interrupted, "'what has taken you? Has Mr. Arley offended you?' "'Offended me? Oh, dear, no. "'You spoke like it. Where have you seen him?' "'I will tell you, Bessie. "'I said I had had an adventure.' In coming from Dame Mellon's cottage, through that dark, shady lane that leads from it, I don't know its name. The Park Lane, I interrupted. It belongs to Miss Bertram's Park, but we have the liberty of passing through it. While well, I was coming quickly along, for it seemed to be getting quite dusk there under the trees, swinging the little straw basket in my hand, and doing it so carelessly that it swung off and went ever so many yards beyond me, just as a lady and gentleman turned the corner. I knew her for Miss Bertram, and a nice face I must say she has, and a charming manner. He stooped to pick up the basket, and she said a few pleasant words to me, something to the effect that she could see I had been to Mrs. Mellon's cottage, no doubt to take her some good cheer. I did not quite catch them, they were over in a moment, and Mr. Arley, for I am sure by your description it was he, yes, yes, no one would be walking with Miss Rose but he, and for that and for the matter of that, he is the only visitor staying at the hall. Go on, Susan. At the very moment that he was holding out the basket to me, a beautiful white hair suddenly sprang out of the sprang out of the edge, bounded directly over his feet, and was lost in the opposite bushes. At least, I don't know where else it could have sprung from, broke off Susan thoughtfully. It seemed to startle him so much that he dropped the basket and leaped back with a smothered cry. Miss Bertram did not appear to have seen it. She turned her head and asked what, the mat what was the matter. "'Oh, nothing,' he answered lightly, save that he had been careless enough to drop the young lady's basket. But I saw that his face had turned of a ghastly whiteness. As I stooped for the basket, for I was quicker than he, the same white hair reappeared from the bushes, crossed the lane as before, passing over his feet, and was lost to sight in the, he in the hedge. "'Bessie!' he shuddered from head to foot like a man in dreadful fear. It is as true as that I am telling it to you. Fear of what? How should I know? Miss Bertram looked about her as though some unseen danger were near, turning her head from side to side. Such was the idea that struck me, but still I do not think she saw the hare. They walked on, wishing me good evening, and I came running all the way home. It must have been a white rabbit, Susan. I assure you it was a hare. I could not mistake it. The question is... Why should it have frightened Mr. Arley? Another question is, I said, passing over that, for in truth I saw no solution to it, and thought Susan must be fanciful, why this should have made you take a prejudice against Mr. Arley? It did not make me. I had nothing. It had nothing to do with it. One reason why I do not like him is that he... That he what, Susan? Well, I hardly know how to express it. But he looked at me in so free and ugly a manner, as if, really, Bessie, it was just as if I were a lass of lightness. I was silent. One or two disagreeable stories had gone about to Mr. Arley's discredit, and people wondered whether they had been quite kept from Miss Bertram. Possibly so, for they were not connected with our immediate neighbourhood, but with his own. 
He lived near St. Huth, near a village seven miles off, upon the small property that had been his father's. Rose Bertram's riches, apart from her own sweet self, must have presented a temptation to him. He passed his time chiefly in London, before being engaged to Miss Bertram, and made debts there. You give that as one reason for taking a dislike to him, Susan, though possibly you are mistaken. What is the other? The other is a private reason of my own, Bessie. I cannot tell it. She sat on the window in deep thought, her blue eyes strangely serious as they gazed outwardly on the gathering gloom, her right hand pushing back unconsciously her fine golden hair. At length, just as it got too dark to see, I made a finish of my work, and we went down to the parlour. Eunice was helping Patience to lay the cloth for supper. Father and Roger were coming in for it. Janey had been in bed long ago. The last thing we did at night was to sing the evening hymn, I or Eunice playing it. Susan offered to play tonight. She was a skilful musician, as compared with us, and her soft touch was of itself melody. It was Susan's custom to read the psalms for the evening to herself after we got into my bedroom, which she shared with me. On this evening she sat down as usual, but almost immediately closed the prayer book. "'No, I cannot read tonight. It is of no use,' she cried almost passionately. "'My wandering thoughts will not let me.' I turned round from the glass, unpinning my collar, and looked at her. Her cheeks were flushed, her eyes wore a troubled light. "'Bessie, will you let me tell you a tale?' "'Certainly I will, dear. "'Then let us put out the lights and sit at the window.' "'She clapped the extinguisher can sink there, sorry. "'She clapped the extinguisher on the candle herself, "'and we sat down at the window, closed now. "'It was a fine night, "'the moonlight flooding hill and dale, "'the bare cornfields, the pasture lands, and the houses, large and small, scattered among them. You know, Bessie, that when Mamma died, I was placed at school at Walborough for two years, to complete my education. It was a notedly good school, not a large one, Miss Robertson, the governess, being very indulgent to us. I took a fancy at once to one of the girls, Agnes Garth. She was about my own age, which was sixteen then, and one of the sweetest, best, loveliest girls I ever saw. Lovelier than you, I interrupted. How silly you are, she exclaimed, laughing and blushing. Of course, I know that I am not ugly, but I could not be compared with her. Not but that the girls thought us a little alike, inasmuch as that we were both fair, with bright complexions and the same coloured hair. They had given her a name, Beauty, and generally called her by it, Beauty Garth. I cannot tell you how I loved that girl. My father and mother were gone, and it seemed that all the love within me was concentrated upon her. She was so gentle, so kind, so good. A very angel. I laughed. Ah, oh, well. It was so, Bessie. Miss Robertson used to say Agnes had no stability, that she might be swayed any way by those she loved. But it was an amiable weakness. We were like sisters all the two years we passed together. She never could think ill of anyone. She put trust in all the world. A sort of cloud hung over her. A cloud? Well, we never could find out who she was. The rest of us talked freely of our home and friends, of our past life. But she was silent as to hers, even to me. An impression obtained in the school, I know not whence derived, that her mother was an actress at a theatre in London, her father she had never known. That much Agnes did tell us. Miss Robertson never spoke upon the subject. Agnes was treated just as the rest of us were, and we knew nothing. Did she go home for the holidays? No, she passed them at school, as I usually did, and perhaps that served to draw us closer together. My two years were nearly up, when one day, when we were with the German master, Miss Robertson sent in for Agnes. And when the class was over and we got back to the ordinary schoolroom, we heard that Agnes had gone to London, in answer to some message received by the governess. She came back in a month's time in deep mourning and told us her mother was dead. But though her frank spirit was subdued and saddened by the loss, 
There was evidently some deeper joy within her that had not existed before. I found out what it was. Beauty was in love. She had met a gentleman in London, and was already secretly engaged to him. She would not tell me his name or who he was, though I asked it over and over again. There will be no necessity for me to be a governess now, she said to me one day, for that's what she was to have been, as her mother left her little, if any, fortune. How old was she, Susan? Eighteen, then, just as I was. This was last year, in the earlier part of it. I left the school at Easter, you may remember. Yes. This, the week previous to it, I was invited to spend the evening with some people in the town who were kind to me, and having formerly lived near Papa's rectory. They having, lived, having formerly lived near Papa's rectory. Beauty was also invited out elsewhere the same evening. It chanced, in returning home, that we both reached the door together. An old maid-servant was my escort. Beauty's was a tall, handsome young man. She held his arm, and I divined, as by instinct, that her lover had come to Walborough. I had a good look at him. The gas-lamp shone right upon his face. He wished her good-night abruptly, and was turning away when Agnes stopped him. "'This is Miss Stanhope, of whom you have so often heard me speak,' she said and of course politeness compelled him to stop and say a few words to me. Not many. Before the door was opened to us, he had lifted his hat and was gone. "'Don't tell of me, Susan,' Beauty entreatingly whispered. "'Miss Robertson might not like it.' "'And did you tell? Why, of course not, Bessie. Would we tell tales of one another? Besides, there was no harm, that I saw, in his just walking home with her. I suppose the friends she had been with sanctioned it. Go on. The next week I left school, and entered on the situation Miss Robertson had procured for me at Lady Leslie's. It was a long, long way from Walborough, about midway, you know, between that place and this, Penryn. Beauty and I could not expect to meet often, but we promised each other, amid our farewell tears and kisses, to correspond constantly. Bessie, I never got but two letters from her. I felt surprised at Susan's tone more than the words. But two letters. One of them was written from school, the other only a week later from London. She had left Walborough, she told me, and was staying with some friends in London until her marriage, which was to take place immediately, and she only wished I could go up to be her bridesmaid, which, of course, was not to be thought of. After that, I never heard from her. And have you never heard yet? Listen. A few months later... At the close of August, I think, or beginning of September, I know it was a warm, hazy day, I was in the schoolroom, correcting exercises, my pupils being out walking with their French maid, when one of the servants came up to say that a young lady was asking for me, and showed her in. It was Agnes, and as the door closed she fell into my arms with a sort of moan. How terribly the girl had changed in the five or six months since we parted, I cannot express to you, Bessie. Her once lovely face had become thin and drawn, her once pretty rounded shoulders sharp. I could not speak for dismay. I saw something was wrong. She clung to me, sobbing and shivering. I was obliged to come to you on my journey, Susan, as this place lay in my way. She gasped out. Some power that I could not resist compelled me. It is only for a few minutes, Susan, only just to see you, Susan, and then I shall be gone again. "'Are you married, dear Agnes?' I whispered, kissing her tenderly. "'I thought I was, Susan,' she said. "'I thought it all that what sorry "'I thought it all that while, though he would not let me tell you, or anyone.' "'And with that she sat down, poor weary girl, "'and laid her face moaning against the long desk. "'You speak of a journey, dear,' I said. "'Where are you going?' "'But she did not answer.' There was a faint, bluish tinge about her lips that I did not like. Evidently she needed both food and rest. The thought came over me to beg of Lady Leslie to allow her to stay a day or two with me. I felt sure she would, being a kind, motherly woman. "'Stay here a few moments, dear,' I whispered, kissing her wan cheek. "'I'm going to bring you a glass of wine and a biscuit.' Lady Leslie, I found, was with friends in the drawing-room. I hardly knew what to do not liking to call her out or to speak before them. 
While I was hesitating, they came out to depart, and then I spoke to Lady Leslie, telling a little of Beauty's history and hinting at my fears that something was wrong. "'By all means, let Miss Garth stay for a few days,' Lady Leslie warmly said. "'If she is in distress or any kind of trouble, all the more need that her friends should see after her.' The children, sorry, the children might have holiday, and I could devote myself entirely to her. I was so pleased and grateful, Bessie, that I burst into tears, that I ran to get a glass of wine from the butler and returned to the schoolroom. It was empty. Beauty was gone. Gone? Quite gone. He must have left the schoolroom almost as soon as I. One of the servants met her in the hall and opened the door for her. Lady Leslie had inquiries made, and we found that Agnes had hastened back to the railway station and taken the train onwards. To London? No, she had come from London. It was to Cornwall. There was some trouble about her ticket. A through ticket, because she had left the train. The railway clerk said it was made out for St. Hooth, Bessie. I have never... Sorry. Me, excuse me. The railway clerk said that it was made out for St. Hooth. Bessie, I have never seen or heard of her from that day to this. St. Hooth is a small place about seven miles off beyond this. I know. I traced it out upon the map and in Bradshaw. But now, why do you suppose I have told you this story? Leaning forward to me as she put the question, I could not fail to see that Susan was agitated. Her soft colour went and came. Her beautiful blue eyes were strangely bright. That man, Hubert Arley, who was to marry Miss Bertram, over whose feet the white hair passed and repassed tonight, startling him to terror, was the lover of Agnes Garth. I uttered an exclamation of dismay. I knew him instantly, Bessie. Though I had seen him but once before, and then by gaslight, I recognised both himself and his voice, and he stood before me in the park lane tonight. It is a very peculiar voice, deep and gruff, as if it lay in his throat. You say Mr. Arley's name is Hubert. His name was Hubert. Agnes never called him anything else. And what I want to know is this. If he is going to marry Miss Bertram, where is Agnes? I could not answer. Thought upon thought crowded my mind, each more unwelcome than the last. All in a moment, another thought, or rather a recollection, came up and it was the worst of all. When do you say this was, Susan, that she came into Cornwall? Just about a year ago. Why, yes, that was the very time. It was about a year ago now, so far as I could remember, that a young lady, weary, anxious, footsore, found her way into the widow Mellon's cottage. She lay ill there for two days, and then disappeared. They could not tell what became of her. Nobody else could tell. Minnie Mellon told a curious tale, but, as people said, she was only a child. Nothing of this did I disclose to Susan, though the description of this young lady, given to me by Mrs. Mellon's sister, who was then at the, ascent, at the cottage, was exactly like the one Susan gave of Agnes Garth. It would not do for us Trinathys to bring up aught against Mr. Arley, once his marriage with Miss Bertram had taken place, he would be our landlord to all intents and purposes, and my father would want his lease renewed the year after next. We got to bed at last, but I could not speak for thinking of it all. Of the story told by Susan, of Miss Bertram's ill luck to be engaged to such a man, of the uncertain fate of poor Agnes Garth, and last, though not least, of the white hair that had run over Mr. Arley's feet. I must have a spice of romance in my composition, I take it, for that white hair kept pushing itself into my thoughts above the rest of, the, of all the rest of the perplexity. There had been some trouble lately with our poultry, especially the geese. Many had sickened and died, and in the morning, as soon as my various duties were over, I put on my sunbonnet to run down to Michael Hartz, who was the game who was gamekeeper to Miss Bertram, to consult his wife, for she was learned in poultry. Mary Hart was not at home. However, Michael, smoking his after dinner pipe at the cottage door, said she had stepped over towards the swampland, 
with a bit of stewed rabbit for old widow Loam, who was ill, thought to be dying. I hardly knew whether to wait for Mary Hart or not. It was nearly one o'clock, our dinner hour. Michael thought she would not be long, so I sat down upon the bench outside the kitchen window and talked to him. Are there any white hairs about, Michael? White hairs? he exclaimed in his slow way, turning his head to look at me. Why, no, Miss Bessie, we've no game of that sort. My cousin, Miss Stanhope, thought she saw a white hare cross the park lane yesterday evening. Must have been a rabbit, said Michael, just as I said to Susan. Folks don't like the white hares in this country, he added, changing his pipe from one hand to another. They bold no good when seen. But how can they be seen if there are none, Michael? Well, I thought the white hairs are not real hairs, but spirits, Miss Bessie, apparitions. I never saw a white hair but once, and don't want to see one again. You have seen one, then? I saw that one, Miss Bessie. It's a matter of ten years ago. Do you remember as far back as that? Of course I do, Michael. I am twenty-two. Excuse me, just being attacked by a cat that wants somewhere to sit. In that red house over yonder, you can see its chimneys above the trees, lived old Treherne and his wife and son. Young Treherne was a bit wild and gave him some trouble, but you know not about that. One autumn day, when I was out with Sir William and a party of the guns and dogs, young Treherne, who made one of the gentlemen, lags behind the rest, telling me of a dog of his that had been sick. When, just as we were crossing the five corner coppice, a white hare, as it looks, ran out of the brushwood right over his feet. Right over his feet, Miss Bessie. I never saw such a thing afore. Young Treherne didn't much like it. I couldn't see I could see that. And he jumped aside ever so far. He thought of the superstition, I suppose, but he made light of it to me. What thing was that, Hart? says he, swearing a bit and shaking his feet, as if he'd shake off the touch of the thing he'd left on his boot. It looked uncommon like a hare, sir, says I, but twas gone so quick there was no telling. We went on then, and no more passed. Nine days after that, young Treon died. He was thrown out of his gig coming home from a dinner, and was killed on the spot. And now, Michael, what is the superstition? Michael smoked for a full minute in his slow way before attempting to answer. It's not much the sort of thing to tell young ladies, Miss Bessie. But I want to know it. I have a very particular reason for wishing to know it. I am a woman grown, remember, Michael, not a child. Well, as to young Treherne, he had talked and laughed too much with Patty, the, win the widow Loam's daughter. Her by token that Mary's gone to take the bit of rabbit to and then turned round and laughed at her for it. A pretty young thing she was, and t'was told... Excuse me, I've got a cat trying to climb up on me. Told that the widow coast him. I didn't know how that might have been. Anyway, Patty died of it. But the superstition, Michael. That is the superstition, Miss Bessie. When a young girl gets treated in that way and dies of it, she comes back in the form of a white hair, wherever his own death shall be at nigh at hand comes back in love to give him warning of it. Yes, I've got Joey sitting on me now, looking for cuddles, so I'll be a bit distracted. A slight shiver took me at the words. Could Mr. Arley's death be near at hand? What a foolish thought, I mentally said, and threw off the shiver and superstition together. That we Cornish people hold so many ridiculous fancies, I know, but surely not to one so ridiculous as this. Your wife does not seem to return, Michael, I said, rising from the bench, so I will not wait longer. Perhaps she can come up to the farm. I should like her to see the geese. She'll come safe enough, Miss Bessie. But do what I could, I could not get these matters out of my mind. Not the superstition, that did not linger in it much, but the story Susan had told of Agnes Garth and the curious likeness that seemed to exist between her and the girl who had gone to Mrs. Mellon's and the coincidence as regarded the time. That afternoon, the tea we had unusually early. Sorry, that afternoon we had tea unusually early, four o'clock to accommodate my father, who was going out. 
I contrived to run down alone to Mrs. Mellon's afterwards. I wanted to question her. Susan was busy over some strips of beautiful old pillow lace that had been her mother's and which had got yellow by lying, sorry, with lying by. It had been washed that afternoon and Susan was pulling it out of prepar pulling it out preparatory to spreading it on the grass to bleach. It served as an excuse for my leaving her. What the young lady sorry what was the young lady like who came here about a year ago, Miss Bessie? Replete, repeated Mrs. Mellon in answer to me. Well, you know, miss, I couldn't see her myself, but my sister Anne, who was over here just then, couldn't talk enough about her beauty and her wan looks and her dreadful sadness. Very fair, was she not, with blue eyes? Oh, very fair, and her eyes the bluest and sweetest and saddest, and her hair a bright golden colour. Minnie was here talking of her only last night, miss. She said that the young lady who came here from your house with the, with the wool had just the same beautiful golden hair. It seemed to me like a confirmation. I, I drew a long breath. Will you tell me the particulars of her coming and of her stay here? I asked. It is a matter of a year ago, Miss Bessie. We were having our tea at this round table one afternoon, Anne and me, and the child, when we heard a sort of stir outside, and Anne went to the door. There stood at it a young girl dressed in black, pale and weary, as if she had travelled far, with a wan, lovely face. Would we allow her to sit down for a few minutes, she asked, and give her a drink of water, for she felt faint. Anne brought her in, and she fainted right off in the chair as she sat down. Well, Miss Bessie, we undressed her and put her into Minnie's bed, for she was a great deal too ill and weak to go away that night. And in that bed she stayed nigh upon three days, not strong enough to get out of it, and crying most all the time, and... Did she tell you her name? I interrupted. You know, she never told her name, nor where she belonged to, nor anything else about herself. But she did say she had walked over from St. Hooth early that morning. We thought she must have been waiting about here all day since, as if waiting for somebody, for two or three people saw her. And Michael Hart, he said, but he told me afterwards I had better not speak of that, broke off Mrs. Mellon, so I'll let her alone. On the third day she got up, Miss Bessie, and I remember well as she sat here with me after our bit of dinner, and was gone. She asked me many questions about Miss Bertram and the marriage it was and the marriage it was said was going to make with that and the marriage it was said she was going to make with Mr Arley, just as if she had known Miss Rosie afore. Leastways it struck me so, and I put the question to her plain. No, she had never seen Miss Bertram in her life, she answered, but she had heard of her. After that I heard her stirring about, and it seemed that she was putting her bonnet and mantle on to leave. I asked her whether she was sure she was strong enough, and whether she had far to go. Not far, only a very little way, she answered me, and she felt quite strong. With that she took off a locket that she had worn on her neck, fastened to some blue ribbon, and put it upon Minnie's neck. Keep it, my dear, she said to her. It is all I have to give you, and I shall not want it where I am going. Upon that she wished me good-bye very hastily, and was gone from the door before I could say a word leaving, as I found afterwards a gold sovereign wrapped in a bit of paper on the table at my elbow. "'Run, Minnie,' I says, and see which way she goes and watch her for a bit. And I thought it likely she might feign again, besides feeling anxious about her. So Minnie ran and watched her ever so far, down to the swampland, wasn't it, child?' "'Yes, mother,' replied Minnie, an elfish-looking child of ten, who had been listening with both her ears. I kept behind her all the way, watching her till I couldn't see her no longer. She went down the lane to the swamp land and never came out again. Never came out again, I exclaimed, the phrase striking me as an odd one. How do you mean, Minnie? She never did come out, replied Minnie. I stood watching her for ever so long. The child means that she never saw her come out, put in the mother. She didn't like to follow her too close for fear of being seen. Did you follow her down the lane, Minnie? After a bit, I did. I saw her under the willows that edges the swamp on this side, and I stopped by the trees halfway down the land to see where she went to. When I didn't see her come back nor nothing, I went on to the willows too, but she was gone. 
But where could she go to? I cried, something like a panic seizing my heart. If she could not walk over the swamp to gain the road, she would sink into it. I'm sure she never came back down the lane, repeated Minnie. I never saw her come. She must have managed to get round the swamp by the dwarf st stumps of trees, Miss Bessie, and so gain the high road that way, put in Mrs. Mellon, her quiet, matter-of-fact tone proving that no worse thought had ever occurred to her. You do not think she could have have got into the swamp? I asked, scarcely above my breath. The woman turned her sightless face to me in surprise. Minnie stared with wandering eyes. The idea to them seemed very far-fetched. Why no, Miss Bessie, there was no fear of that kind. There wouldn't be. Had the poor young lady lost her footing and fell in, which was not likely, she'd naturally have cried out, and there was Minnie at hand to hear her. The conviction that, had she put herself in purposely, she would not have cried out, ran through my mind like a flash of lightning, and then I mentally called myself a wicked girl for thinking it. Would you let me see the locket she gave Minnie? I asked aloud. Dame Mellon took a small key from her pocket, felt her way to the dresser, and unlocked a tea caddy that stood on it. I keep it locked up for fear Minnie should lose it, she remarked, placing it in my hands. These small things are so easy dropped and children be so careless. Ah, no need to take a second look. The golden locket had a lock of golden hair inside it, Susan's hair, beyond all doubt, and it bore the inscription, Susan to Agnes. I should like to show this to my cousin. It is very pretty, I said impulsively. Will you let me take it home, Mrs. Mellon? You shall have it back tomorrow. Ready permission was given, and I, I was desired not to be in a hurry to return the locket. The old woman took her stick and walked with me, talking to the little bridge. Some children were playing at the entrance to the park lane, and Minnie ran off to them. I wish you would tell me one thing, I said in a low tone. What was it that Michael Hart told you? You may trust me, you know. Dear, yes, I may, Miss Bessie. Well, Michael saw the young lady that same afternoon, talking with Mr. Arley in the coppice. He was coming home from shooting, and she darted out from the coppice, as if she had put herself there to wait for him, and laid her hand upon his arm. Mr. Arley shook her hand off and swore at her, asking where she had sprung from and what she wanted. Michael heard that much as he walked onwards with the dogs. Half an hour later he came by again and they were still there. She was crying and moaning bitterly, and he was calling her a tramp in harsh tones and threatening to give her into custody for molesting him unless she went back at once to whence she came. Michael didn't know how the quarrel ended, except that Mr. Arley must have left her there, for he presently saw him cross the park lane on his way to the hall. It wasn't a thing to talk about, you see, Miss Bessie, and that's why he wanted me to be silent. All sorts of troubles were worrying my brain as I went home. It was poor Agnes Garth, safe enough. But what could I do in it? And where was she? Very much to my surprise, when I came within sight of our gate, I saw Mr. Arley's horse fastened to it, and himself on the grass plat with Susan. She had her hands folded before her, and her face, as she spoke to him, wore a cold, haughty expression. Suddenly he wheeled round on his heel, came out, mounted his horse, and rode past me, not vouchsafing me any notice by word or look. Susan explained to me what had happened. She was spreading her lace on the grass, putting a stone at the ends of each piece to secure it, when Mr. Arley rode by. Seeing Susan, he checked his horse suddenly, dismounted, and came in. "'So you are one of Farmer Trenathy's daughters, my dear,' he began, in a free tone that Susan did not like at all. "'And where have you been hiding yourself, pray, that I never saw you before last night?' "'Mr. Trenathy is my uncle,' replied Susan, turning from the lace to face him. "'Have you come to live here?' No. To stay for a time, at any rate, I conclude. I am very glad. It is not often we get such beauty as yours in this out-of-world place. Mr. Arley, began Susan, you have taken upon yourself to ask me questions. In return, may I put one or two to you? Fifty, if you like, my dear. The more the better. When you were quite a lad, 
Were you not placed for three or four years with the Reverend Philip Stanhope of Grasmere? That lad's name was, I know, Hubert Arley. Just so. Mr. Stanhope was my tutor. You respected and liked him, I believe? Liked and respected Stanhope? I just did. What next? I am his daughter, Miss Stanhope, and a gentlewoman, Mr. Arley. He seemed quite taken too, and his face flushed, Susan said, but he had the grace to change his manner to one of respect, offered his hand, and said that he was glad to see her. There is another question I wish to ask you, and it is a painful one, Susan went on. One very painful to me to put. Can you tell me where Agnes Garth is? He stared at her for a moment, his countenance visibly changing. Agnes Garth! he presently rejoined, breaking the silence. I do not know any one of the name. I think you did know her, Mr. Arley. She was my best friend, dear to me as a sister. We were at school together at Warborough. For this past twelve month I have been anxiously waiting for news from her, watching for it daily, and it never comes. I protest I cannot understand why you should say this to me, Miss Stanhope, he replied, his manner cold, his tone repellent. I never heard of the person you mention. Allow me to wish you good evening. And with that he turned quickly as I had seen him turn, and took his departure. Susan told me this as we sat side by side on the bench under the large pear tree, the horse's hoofs dying away in our ears as they grew more distant. I held out the gold locket on my glove. Do you know this, Susan? She caught hold of it, gave one look, and burst into tears. Oh, Bessie, where did you get this? It was the keepsake I gave to Agnes when I left school. She gave me that pretty cross, and I wear it in exchange. I told her all, even my doubts and fears about the swamp. It is true I had not meant to say so much, but tales at such moments expand in the telling. But, Susan, dear, I added in conclusion, you must keep all this strictly quiet. It would not do to stir it, stir it in for my, stir in it for my father's sake. I keep it quiet, she retorted, turning her tearful eyes upon me. Why, Bessie, do you imagine this is a thing we mortals can control? If my poor Agnes does indeed lie in that swampland, rely upon it that a higher power holds its elucidation in his hands. The stars were beginning to twinkle in the sky. The moon was rising. The scent of the closing flowers was almost lost in the cool air, and still we sat on. Out came Eunice, wondering why we stayed there when we must know the early supper was ready. "'You will take me to look at this swampland tomorrow, Bessie,' whispered Susan as we rose. "'I cannot rest until I see it,' and I promised. "'But, like many another promise, it was not fated to be performed. "'Some friends, not expected, came over from St. Huth in the morning to spend the day with us, "'and the next day it was raining, pouring cats and dogs, as Janie said when she had to go through it to school. "'Aye, and the next day also.' Altogether, the following week had come in when we went. The sun, glowing and red, was nearing its setting, was shining on this marshland as we gazed upon it. It was a curious-looking spot. Half water, half earth, wholly black mud, as it seemed to Susan. In Sir William's time he would not have had this bay touched. It would be valuable some time, he said, but he should not trouble himself to make it so. It lay about as far from our house, on that side, as the hall did on the other. The willows, spoken of by Mrs. Mellon, drooped over the edge of a portion of it, then came a crowd of rushes, then the dwarf trees, some of them only stumps. You see, Susan, I observed, she could have crept round by the rushes and stumps, and so gained the road. Yes, I see, replied Susan, it would have been possible, I suppose. On the other hand, she may have thrown herself in to escape her troubled life. Don't think it, Susan, for heaven's sake. As we regained the road, which was narrow just there, not much better indeed than a lane, Miss Bertram drove up in her pretty low carriage, drawn by its cream-coloured pony, Mr. Arley sitting beside her. She pulled up to speak to me, and he raised his hat. Suddenly, 
as if it sprang from out of the ground, for I'm sure I saw not where else it could have come from. A white hare was disporting itself under the pony's feet. Whether it was a real hare or a phantom, the, the pony became curiously terrified, his eyes glaring, his mouth foaming. The hare disappeared almost instantly, but the animal continued to rear and plunge. Miss Bertram was a remarkably timid girl, although she did drive this hitherto quiet pony. She dropped the reins, and would have leapt out. Mr. Arley prevented her, jumped out himself, and went to the pony's head. He had not, I am sure, seen the hare. But he saw now. The hare, and this seemed to me the strangest part of it, the hare which had certainly disappeared was back again, running over his feet. With a sort of suppressed yell, Mr. Arley jumped back and loosed his hold of the pony. Again, the hare had disappeared. He re-caught the pony's head, and Miss Bertram jumped out. "'Slim, what can be the matter with you?' she cried, addressing the pretty and trembling cream-coloured animal. "'Did you see anything frighten him?' she added to me. "'Did you, Hubert?' But what could I answer? Nothing. Mr. Arley was now leading the pony forward when he seemed quiet. And, sorry, and when he seemed quiet, they got in and drove off, Mr. Arley taking the reins. Once more, but this time we only knew of it by hearsay, Mr. Arley was frightened by the white hair. It was on the following Sunday. He was walking across the churchyard with our clergyman, Mr. Chasnell, they having stayed in the vestry after service to discuss some parish business, when, just as they were going by old Mrs. Barton's high tomb, a white hare ran across Mr. Arley's feet, seemed to stand on them for a moment. "'Why, that looked just like a hare!' cried the clergyman. "'Where has it gone to? Has it startled you?' he added to Mr. Arley, seeing that his face had turned whiter than death. "'I... I don't know what it was,' replied Mr. Arley as they looked about but the hare was gone. The Reverend Charles Chasnell talked of this. That's how it came to be known. He told people that he had seen a white hare. Being a stranger in Cornwall, just appointed to the living, he had never heard of the superstition. "'What news do you think I have got?' cried Roger, coming in to breakfast on the Tuesday morning. "'That old bog is going to be re redeemed, drained, and... "'I'll believe it when I see it,' interrupted Father. "'Sir William was always talking of that, but he never did it, "'and the fields around are nothing but a marsh. "'It has long been shame of the place.' "'It's really going to be done now,' said Roger, "'smiling at his father's vehemence. "'Some gentlemen are coming to the hall today about it. "'Scientific men from London, "'and the workers have been begun immediately. "'The bailiff himself told me, they say,' "'and here Roger laughed outright, uh, sorry, laughed outright, "'that there was a great value in the swamp as it is now.' Father looked at him quite angrily. Value in it? In the mud, or the water, or both combined, they talk of its chemical properties. Is it Mr. Arley who has set this all in motion, Stone says, and has persuaded Miss Bertram to have it done? Time it was, grunted Father. That swamp has always been a sore point with him. Not that day, but the next, during the afternoon, we saw several gentlemen, followed by some rough workmen, not our ordinary country labourers, go down the road on their way to the swamp. Mr. Arley was first and foremost of them. He looked wonderfully handsome, was talking eagerly and laughing gaily, just as though he had forgotten the white hair. But, it is the sad truth, before the sun had well set that night, he was carried back past our gate, cold and dead. That excursion to the swamp was a fatal one, I cannot tell you precisely what happened, or how, nor is it necessary. For some purpose or other, the workmen began dragging the swamp near the willows, perhaps to see what sort of mud it really was. The first thing they got up, apart from mud, was a black bonnet. The second looked like a rake full of golden hair. That made them drag on again with a purpose, and they drew up a young lady. It was poor Agnes Garth. Her face presented the most wonderfully preserved appearance. Hubert Arley could not fail to recognise her. Those around him told afterwards how he turned cold and sick. But, in the excitement of this finding, 
they had been neglecting proper precautions and had ventured too far over the swamp, standing on the pieces of wood that jutted out from the old fence. The wood had become porous and rotten, and it broke, and one of them fell down into the swamp, uttering a shrill and bitter cry. It was Mr. Arley. He had sunk utterly, was gone clean out of sight, and he did not rise again. As soon as the apparatus could be disentangled from what it had already brought up, it was sent down again in search of him. He was quite dead, choked, probably, by the poisonous mud, and, do what they would, they could not restore life to him. Many a year has gone by since then. My father is at rest in the churchyard, and I am Bessie Trenathy still. I am at the old home with Roger and his delicate wife, who whispers to me that she hopes I shall never leave it. For what should the children do without Aunt Bessie? Susan married Charles Chasnell. He did not long remain in Cornwall. He had good connections and interest, and got better and better preferment, and is now Dean of Windsor. She meets Lady Calloway, formerly Miss Bertram, sometimes in society, and they rarely fail to exchange a word about the old place, Penryn. But there's one topic Susan never talks about, save to me, and perhaps once in a way to her husband, and that is the sad history of the past, of the ill-fated Agnes, and of Hubert Arley, and the warning of the phantom hare. And that concludes the stories for tonight. Thank you.